the way on the way back to where all the vendors and sponsors are. Um, the first table you encounter is uh, run by a guy named Ted. Ted is recording all of the talks that are available to us. He enabled us to do the internet streaming. So if you're uh, for our friends at home, he's the one that makes that happen. If any of the talks that you found, if you find them interesting, you want to share them with your coworkers, your boss, your friends, your family, your children, you're, please go see Ted, buy a DVD. Uh, the reason that we're able to have these recordings and put them online eventually is because Ted, so please support him, buy some DVDs. I know some of you work for mega corporations, so please use their budget. Why <laughs> Um, on top of that, we take all of the feedback that we get from, from you all to heart. We want to make this continue to make this conference as best as we can. So if you have anything that you think was amazing, if you thought that these two guys were great speakers, you want to see them back, let us know. If you think something that we did was horrible, we'd like to know that too. We, want, we take all of the feedback that you give us Heart, and we try it every year to make this a better conference. So send an email to feedback at smoocon.org. Like I said, we take all of that to heart. We really do want to make this a better conference year after year. And the way that we do that is from your all's feedback. So please do that. Um, if you drove here and you parked in the hotel and you don't want to pay $40 for your parking, go by registration. We have a 50% discount. That is if you are not staying here, if you stayed in the hotel, your parking is going to be cheaper than if you use our code. So don't do that if you're staying here. Um, last thing, I have some stuff to give away. I'm, don't, I'm out of trivia questions, so I'm just going to throw. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to throw is a little heavy. <laughs> right, I don't mind getting hurt. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a it's a tactical notebook. <laughs> so, in addition to having a zipper closer closing and uh, pen loops, it also has a carabiner clip for those who like to right their notebook to their belt. It's heavy, so everybody's paying attention. Right? Yeah. So this heavy thing. talk in this room, then we'll be breaking down the rooms and having our closing plenary session. Uh, we hope all of you join us for that. It's a, for the first time we're going to have a live debate at ShmooCon, so please show up and enjoy it. Uh, it should be a hell of a lot of fun and hopefully get some good information out of that. So, uh, I'm sure you all are tired of hearing me speak, and you'd much rather hear uh, Paul and Matt, so please give a warm welcome to Paul and Matt. Hi there, my name is Paul McMillan. This is my colleague, Matt King. We both work at Oracle. Uh, we do infrastructure security, so that means we're worried about the low-level security of the hardware that we ship and that we have operating in the data center. Uh, the lawyers have asked me, not, uh, asked me to help you understand that I'm not talking about specific Oracle products or uh, making specific <laughs> assertions about anything. Uh, anyway, so what are we talking about? we we'll start with what this talk is not about. This talk is not about virtual machines. It's not about runtime security. It's not about laptops and desktops. We're talking about hardware that you have in the data center behind a door with a locked door with an armed guard who will shoot someone who tries to fiddle with your hardware. Uh, we'd like to secure all the other si situations too, but that's the one that we're talking about today. We're also not talking about trusted computing and uh, malicious vendors, uh, or malicious hardware. We figure we have reasonably good supply chain security and uh, other people deal with that for us. So what are we talking about? We're talking about bare metal servers. That's a metal bear on a cloud. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, I figured you needed that to help you understand what we're talking about here. So no hypervisors, no VMs. We're not talking about uh, containerization. We're, we're giving customers access directly to the hardware. Uh, 
And in that context, they can run their own kernel, they have access to the low-level hardware, they can change the firmware on the devices. This concerns me because I'd like to give the machine to another customer after someone has it. So let's talk about the problems here. For our purposes, there are lots of different kinds of things that count as firmware. There's uh, FPGAs, microcode, the bootloader. We're really calling anything that is persistent and controls behavior on a device firmware in this talk. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, so customers can update the firmware and we're trying to get the firmware into a known good state after they've had a, access to do that. Um, one example of seeing these kinds of things happen in the wild was with the uh, hardware firmware backdoors that the equation group was found to be doing. Um, the traditional hardware vendor stance of don't run bad software on your device doesn't really work very well here when the hardware is owned by one party but accessed by a different party. So our goal, give customers pristine systems even after someone else has had access to it. So this means we need to have no dependencies on what someone else has done previously. We need an automatable process for getting it back into that state. You know, if, if your process to get things back into a non-good state is walk up to it and plug an FPGA programmer into it, that's not really going to work very well. JTAG doesn't scale well when a data tech has to come out with a cart. Um, and the most important thing we're trying to get to here is having device security even in the face of bugs in the device firmware. We want to be able to say, we know that this device is secure and we don't want to depend on the running firmware to have no bugs to be able to say that. Um, even, and we want to be able to make sure that a customer can't brick a device or get it into an unrecoverable state. Uh, replacing thousands of devices isn't feasible. Uh, even if the cost isn't a, isn't a problem, the supply chain management is a nightmare. So with that, I'm going to give it up to Matt here. All right. So before we can uh, go deeply into what we've done, uh, some background on what, what's in a modern server, right? What do these things look like? How do they get put together? How do they end up in our data center? Uh, what happened to get us to the point where we're concerned about the firmware on them? So this is my uh, terrible rendering of what the inside of a modern server looks like. It hasn't actually changed a whole lot from those classic PCI architecture slides. The biggest difference is your Northbridge and your CPU are in the same package now, uh, integrated, all the high-speed I.O., the DRAM hangs off of that, but there's still a south bridge with some more I.O. Uh, you still have memory, you still have devices. It, it's all pretty much the same. Um, the other notable part on here is the server platforms very regularly have a, a BMC uh, management controller that lets you do sort of remote management of the system, like turn it on and off, or maybe use a keyboard and mouse on it over the network. Um, one of the things that has changed in the last 20 years is all of these things now have microcontrollers in them. Uh, the microcontrollers in blue in this picture and the firmware in orange um, are pretty much everywhere. Uh, if you've got like an AMD CPU, it's got a platform security processor embedded in it. Uh, if you have an Intel chipset, it's got a manageability engine. Uh, your hard drives and SSDs all have microcontrollers in them managing the interface and giving your operating system the illusion of uh, logical block addressing because that's not how any of the actual storage medium works anymore. Um, your USB devices all have some microcontroller managing that bus interface. Uh, so there's there's very legitimately, microcontrollers and everything. Um, this picture is still a little simplified. There's still a whole lot more stuff in there. Uh, your SSDs are actually uh, multi-core things. If you want half a million IOPS, it takes more than one cheap little microcontroller to manage that. Uh, a lot of your peripherals may have multiple microcontrollers in them. When you look at things like wireless, uh, they often have one for the host interface and one for the baseband. Um, your EMMC chips have a little microcontroller in them managing that interface. So even your firmware storage sometimes has microcontrollers in it. Uh, these things are everywhere in the system and there's lots of places for somebody who's trying to embed something persistent into your platform to do it. Um, and then when we get a server, right, when we buy a thing, when it shows up in our data center, uh, every last one of these firmwares has been programmed already somewhere. Uh, at some point in time. Um, and the, the 
big issue with this is uh, if you're buying 10,000 servers, you don't just call Dell or Lenovo or somebody and say, uh, can you overnight ship me 10,000 of these things? Uh, they don't have that many sitting on shelves ready to go. Uh, there's a real long supply chain management problem and it takes quite a while to actually get you servers in that volume. So, you know, where do all these parts of the server come from? Uh, you've got, you know, your big IC components like processors, uh, DRAM coming from, you know, US, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Ireland, where most of the major fabs are located. Um, and then you've got, you know, these components are being soldered down to PCBs that are being made. Uh, a lot of them in China and, and Asia. Um, those, those PCBs and components go together and get assembled and turned into, you know, say a network device or a hard drive. Uh, a lot of that happens in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then they get sent to data centers around the world. So by the time we get a rack full of servers in a data center, uh, they've been around the world. Everything in that server has probably been around the world on the order of twice. Uh, and it's taken two to three months from the time we order it to the time it lands in the data center. And that's if we did a real good job. Sometimes it can take more if there's shortages. Uh, and so we run into some problems, right? Um, it's hard to ensure three, four months from now that the firmware I want on the system in four months is the firmware that's on the system when it arrives. Uh, the reality is there's going to be bugs in the firmware. New versions are going to be issued. Uh, sometimes things are just going to fail, right? You're going to have component failures or bit rot or something else goes wrong with it. At some point in this process, well, these parts are flying around the world uh, and being put together and tested. And so when we get this system in the data center and it's finally in our possession in a secured location, we want to know that whatever firmware is running on this system is actually what we intended, right? We want to be, have real high confidence that there's nothing else in there. Uh, both because we're concerned about the security issues of somebody else having programmed them, but more practically speaking, because there's just a lot of ways this can and does go wrong just through, you know, all sorts of real common errors in how these things are built and assembled and, and get to us. And if we can solve the security problems, we also solve uh, the much more common operational issues. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, what are the best practices available today. So the first one that you start with is signed firmware. Um, many of your devices have this now, uh, you know, your network card, your, uh, your uh, CPU updates, your storage devices, they all have signed firmware. What do we mean when we say signed firmware? So you take the, take the firmware, the whole blob, the vendor will generally sign it, and then when you go to update the device, the device will only apply a, a firmware that has the correct signature on it. Um, this gives you a, a number of properties. This uh, generally is used to prevent the wrong firmware from going into a device. Um, this prevents a lot of accidental mess ups. Uh, you know, for example, the recent issue where Ubuntu would render your laptops unbootable was because the device that stored the firmware wasn't strongly enforcing signature across the access. Um, this is widely implemented. NIST says do it. Um, works okay. Uh, you know, it kind of does what it says. The problem is it doesn't do other things. So si uh, when you have a signed piece of firmware, yes, you know it came from the manufacturer. That doesn't mean it's any good. Um, and it turns out there's lots of poorly written firmware that is signed by manufacturers. Uh, the second issue is that when you apply that firmware update, the r currently running firmware is the thing that does the signature checking. Um, this means that if you mess the device up, there's no easy way to go back to an old firmware. Sometimes there's AB boot sit situations, but fundamentally the device is in a weird state. You don't know what version of the firmware you're running. You uh, can ask the firmware what version it has. It'll give you back a version string, but the thing that gave you that version string is the running firmware. So if there's a compromise, it's very difficult to detect in these devices that you don't have direct access to. And then when you need to update, the only way you can do that is wait for the vendor to get around to giving you a new firmware to do the update. Um, so that's, uh, even with those limitations, we ask vendors for signed firmware and it's a really good first step. The next step that vendors are taking, and this is becoming more common 
Uh, it's still not in every device, but uh, particularly in enterprise-grade devices, they have what's called secure boot. Uh, this may, takes that signature checking process and extends it into the boot process. After the firmware is applied, loaded into the device, as the device boots, the ROM checks the bootloader, the bootloader checks the kernel, and the device comes up, and the only thing that can come up in the device is signed by the vendor. Um, this prevents runtime bugs from getting persistence after you remove power. This isn't, that's not ne necessarily very useful if you never remove power from a shared multi-tenant system. Um, and this is common in things like game consoles, carry locked phones. Um, the other thing to note about this is that in these cases, the keys are usually burned into the device. Uh, that means that uh, when, if, if there's ever a key compromise, you have to replace the device. Uh, it's kind of expensive. Uh, it also means that, it does, again, it doesn't si solve this, any of the problems with code signing, and it means that the configuration data isn't signed. So in these devices, uh, very often there's a separate area for the firmware and the configuration. The configuration is all of the runtime bits that help the device go. So you've got, you know, for instance, here's a list of bad blocks. Here's uh, device strings, usually the serial number is part of configuration. Um, all, of those, all of those areas in the device are unsigned because they change. You know, as, as a vendor or as an end user, uh, these things can also have like temperature data. So uh, one of the things that Secure Boot doesn't prevent is exploits which work based on that configuration data. Uh, you can have a perfectly executed Secure Boot with a buggy firmware and the configuration data can re-exploit the running firmware every time you boot the device. Uh, so that's another pretty significant limitation, and that, by the way, is how the ME got popped recently. It wasn't, wasn't a bug in the firmware signing, it was a bug in the configuration parsing that allowed them to get in and change, change the running code there. The uh, next technique that we have here is measurement. We can ask the device, what firmware are you running? The device will usually tell us, uh, you, uh, sometimes that will be signed by a private key in the device so we can know we're talking actually to the real device. And uh, when measurement is done properly, it can prove to us what code the device has loaded and is running. Um, unfortunately, most devices don't support this today in a way that is secure and verifiable. Uh, most of today's measurement code actually runs in the device firmware, which has all of the problems we just talked about. Um, the other thing that's tricky about measurements is that they're unstable. You know, you get out a hash, that's great, but what does that hash mean? Um, and in men, you often have many versions of firmware, you have many, con uh, the configuration is usually not measured, sometimes it is, sometimes it's measured separately, but you still have this problem of, I have a bunch of hashes, okay, so I can build the table of what I expect, but it doesn't tell me quite as much as I'd like to know about the state of the device. So, our challenge here. Signing is insufficient. The measurement available today is not good enough for the level of security we want to offer. So what do we do? Um, so this is uh, where I go back into some crimes I may or may not have committed long ago as a hardware engineer. Um, the, the issue with hardware engineering uh, is that when you get a device, pre-production device, trying to make it work, uh, it never does, right? The first, the first rev of something, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, even getting them to turn on, you know, get, get power, make lights blink, uh, really hard on modern devices that have lots of complicated power management features uh, that mean turning on is a whole lot of stages. Um, so, you know, how do you take something from basically sand, which you start out with to get the silicon and, and make the wafers, and turn that into, you know, an X-Gen server. Um, what, what kind of challenges do you have to overcome to make that happen? So one of the things that uh, happens a lot, right, you, you have a new device, it comes up, uh, you've gotten it powered on, uh, it doesn't have any firmware on it, right? You, you now have something, new device, uh, it, it's basically inert, you have to have a way to get firmware into it. And you have to have a way to enable your developers and your engineers to, to fix it when they're doing initial debug and development, um, right? Uh, the update routines don't appear out of thin air 
uh, fully functional, uh, especially if you're doing secure boot and code signing. It takes a lot of work. It's very complicated code. Uh, it takes multiple iterations to get that work. You have to be able to somehow fix the device uh, if you break it. Um, because when you have a couple dozen pre-production devices, you can't afford to throw them away when you have a bad build of your firmware. Uh, that, that doesn't work. That sets back uh, development way too much, and it's real expensive. Um, and as you're doing firmware development, uh, as firmware has gotten more and more complicated, it's, it's getting to be bigger and bigger software applications. Um, there's more places for bugs. Uh, so you have to do a lot of standard software debugging, and you have to have mechanisms to keep trying new builds and to program these devices. You have to have ways to test out the hardware when not all of the hardware is working. Uh, you don't want to go build a new device because one of your IOs is busted if you can test the other 10. Um, and so hardware engineers have been facing this problem for a long time, right? We've been putting microcontrollers in things for a while now, uh, and this is a problem that they've had to solve. Um, so some of the things they've done is added recovery mechanisms to their devices, right? Nearly everything has a mechanism where regardless of the state uh, the device is in now, there's some way to, to, you know, poke it with a big stick, hit it with a hammer, and, you know, reset it, get it back into a known state. Um, this essentially never depends on the firmware that's running in the device uh, currently. Right, it'll be built into ROM. Uh, they would use JTAG or serial ports to give themselves access to some bits they can poke to change the state or to put new bits in. Um, you know, various other proprietary methods in order to get the device from you know a non-functional state back into a functional state. Um, so the the question we ask ourselves: Well, can can we use this for security? That's the band yes for the two of you that got it. <laughs> I heard at least one person laugh, so I know at least one of you recognized them. Um, <laughs> uh, so how, how do we use these, right? We, we want to apply updates to the mutable firmware, right? The, the bits that can change that are stored in non-volatile storage. Uh, we want to update them without ever uh, executing unknown code. Right? We don't want to depend on any of the code that's in the device because we don't know what state it's in. Um, so we go and we take some of these hardware mechanisms that operate you know, independent of what state the device is in. Um, and the reason this works is because you know, these mechanisms, they, they were purposely designed to work this way. They were purposely designed to work regardless of what, hap what was going on with the device when you, when you start operating this mechanism. Uh, so it doesn't depend on, you know, what firmware is uh, in the non-volatile storage. It doesn't depend what firmware has been loaded on the device. It doesn't depend on what the current state of execution is. Uh, because generally what happens is you, you know, put the microcontroller into, you know, a, a break. You pause it. You stop it. Or you just don't ever let it start its normal boot flow. And you, you shove some other bits into the thing that you want there. Um, so just sort of an example of how this works. Uh, I don't think this is actually representative of anything we've seen, but it's sort of a high-level overview of, of, you know, uh, what tends to happen. Um, you force the device into a recovery mode. So there's a lot of ways to trigger this. Uh, real common ones are just like a jumper on the board. So a lot of times the engineering systems will have a jumper or a switch or something on them that you throw the switch and it's connected to a pin strap on the chip. And when you do that, the chip, instead of going and fetching its bootloader from its normal reset vector, will do something else instead. It'll execute some code in ROM, or it'll sit there and wait for you to you know, write it or do something else. It, it doesn't start actually executing its firmware. So it, it sits, and it, it never goes into the code you don't know and don't trust. Uh, and then you give it a bootloader that you know, uh, right? You, you put the code you want on there. Uh, once the code you want, uh, you've, you've reprogrammed at, at least some bit of its storage with your good bootloader. Sorry, not good, known bootloader. Uh, you reboot the device, and, in, and you let it reboot normally, and now it's executing code that you know, right? And you know because you put it in there. Uh, this is not code that just happened to be there. It's code you just put in there a few seconds ago. Um, and then you let it go to the point where you can do your normal update routine, right? You, you just 
uh, let it finish because you're now operating out of code you know, right? So you, you go into the bootloader and you tell it, hey, I need you to update. Uh, the, the update routine is entirely contained in the code you know. And you've gotten through this whole process without ever executing any code you don't trust and that you don't know. Um, this code might still have bugs, right? Uh, usually this is just going to be reapplying the, the latest and greatest firmware and bootloader that the vendor has given you may still have plenty of bugs, uh, but it's the bugs you know about and, and not somebody else's backdoors. Um, so how do we actually go about doing this then in production, right? This is not, we, we can't go walk up to, as Paul mentioned earlier, walk up to servers and plug something into them to, to flip jumpers on thousands of systems every time we move them between customers. Um, so it turns out uh, there's no real standard way to access a lot of these mechanisms in production hardware. Uh, lots of them are enabled for developers in pre-production devices. Uh, it's not as common to have access to these in production devices, and they're not really easy to connect to in a normal server without doing some custom hardware. Um, so you get, you, you go through, and we, we actually had to build uh, a custom device that lets us connect between some management interface, right, that lets us send commands to sequence all the things we're trying to do, and you know, plug into, if we've got a UART on a device, you know, have some GPIO plug into the UART and let us drive that interface to um, write the bits we need into the device. Uh, and, and importantly, this custom hardware that we have uh, that's just moving bits around has no runtime updatable firmware. So this is how we break the cycle of how do you know that your thing is in a good state? Well, there's no way to update it. There's no path from the server or even from the management plane to update it. Uh, if we need to update these, it gets real painful. So uh, we've, we've kept it small and simple and uh, right here. So we've actually got uh, just the PCB of one of the real early pre-production devices. Uh, I know it looks like a PCIe card. Uh, this is absolutely not a PCIe card. The data traces aren't hooked up. It turns out that if you want to put some custom hardware in a server, oh, put some custom hardware in a server and be able to connect it to external interfaces for management or because there's external ports on a system you need, uh, have power connected uh, wires up to your internal devices, a PCIe slot's a real good place to put it. Uh, so we've used that form factor, we're leaching power off the slot, but otherwise uh, it's just a small microcontroller and some GPIO to connect uh, our, our management plane to, you know, the internal device interfaces that we need to drive in order to force this. So, you know, jumpers, UARTs, those kinds of things. Uh, and that lets us, you know, drive the management process, right? So if, you're, if your process is like the example process I outlined, pull a jumper, and then send some bits over, say, a serial port to the device, this is how we do it, right? We shut down the server, we pull the jumper, we turn it back on, the device goes into its recovery state, we send it some bits, we reboot the whole thing, and now it's, it's good. Uh, anything else we should? Uh, I, I, I was gonna say, it, it, so it turns out. Oh, yeah. Nah, that's, that's real. <laughs> yeah, okay. it was, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of complications with making all this work. Um, right, it turns out because you're using interfaces and mechanisms that vendors don't really support well, uh, you run into lots of fun corner cases. Um, so, you know, when we started uh, putting together the slides for this, we thought we were gonna come here and talk about this really cool thing we built. Uh, it turns out it, it's, not that, this is not the exciting part. Um, it's got a ton of limitations. Uh, this is a, a really, really purpose-built, very specific thing for our systems. Uh, it is not generally applicable. Um, we have a real big, real homogenous fleet, right? We have a lot of the same devices across a lot of the same systems. Uh, so if we custom build something to allow us to drive this process on one specific device, uh, we can deploy that thousands of times, but it's not going to help anybody that doesn't have that specific device. Um, it takes a lot of vendor support. Uh, we've spent 
uh, I want to say years at this point, working with specific vendors, trying to get them to help us actually support these kinds of mechanisms in the way we need so we can deploy them. Um, and it's still kind of iffy whether or not they will help you get there or not. Some of them won't. Um, when you are going and erasing data, uh, some devices will log runtime status information in their storage. Um, the vendors use that for diagnostics and failure analysis when you have returns. Uh, you can lose that data real quick, and that makes when you start seeing device failures a lot harder to debug and get vendor support for. Um, putting custom cables into servers sucks uh, in a lot of ways, right? Cables can fall off. That's real fun to, to diagnose when things stop working. Um, your inventory management people will be very unhappy, uh, especially if you're going through like five revisions of something like this to get it working and productized and you need different custom cables for every one of them that they have to track and manage and maintain inventory of. Um, uh, it, yeah. Um, and, and you can also, you know, you can potentially corrupt the, the devices you're doing this to. Uh, you might accidentally erase things like serial numbers or identifiers or configuration data that you really actually kind of want in your device. Uh, turns out you don't want all your NICs to come up with the same MAC address. Uh, uh, that, that's not all, right? Reverse engineering is expensive and slow. Um, like I said, it, it takes a lot of coordination with the vendor and it still takes a lot of work to verify uh, what the vendor is telling you. Um, it takes a lot of discussions and you, you have to talk not to the vendor's field reps and their, their field service support engineers. You have to talk to the people who actually built their thing and wrote their firmware. Um, and explain to them what you're trying to do and hope they understand and see if they can actually help you get this process working um, because it requires a lot of real deep, low-level technical detail. Um, and that means you probably are under NDA with your vendors uh, and have spent a lot of time talking to them. Um, uh, as Paul mentioned before, uh, you have to reboot the device in a lot of cases, uh, which might mean rebooting the servers. Um, that's not a lot of fun on multi-tenant systems. Uh, it impacts our component selection. We've had to make choices about which devices from which vendors we will buy based on whether or not they can support us. Um, and so it's something you have to think about really early in your hardware selection process. You can't just backport this onto anything you want. Um, some devices use non-volatile storage with real low write cycle counts. Uh, so if you're not being careful, you may break your own devices. Uh, something only supports a couple hundred writes. Uh, and you do this every time you move a system from one customer to another, that might not take a long time. Uh, and if you can do it, so can attackers. Uh, secure boot really helps with this because it means, in theory at least, only vendor signed code can go back on the device. But you have to be real careful about how you provide access to the mechanisms that are doing this. Um, So, uh, as Matt said, you know, what we have now has a lot of limitations, but uh, we are hopeful for the future. Um, the first place that we think we're going to be able to go with this on a lot of devices, and, uh, you know, as vendor support improves, that'll be more and more of the devices, is moving in band. Right now, you know, we have this hardware with pins and cables all, all around the inside of the server, that's not very enterprise. Uh, the guys at the hardware device, hardware group give me really, really dirty looks when I tell them that I'm just gonna plug some pins into some jumpers. Uh, they, they really don't like that. So if we can do it without extra hardware, that means not only does that improve our reliability on the device, you know, those, those cables don't fall out, but it also means that you can do it without extra custom hardware in your, in your server. It means that everyone else can also have this level of assurance for kicking at attackers out of hardware when they're not sure what's happened to a device or it's been compromised. Um, the other thing this will help with is recovering devices that are used for guests, for you know, multi-tenancy. If you can recover one, one device at a time without taking the server all the way down, uh, you, 
you can have a better chance of doing that. The next thing that we're hoping to improve here is improve our detection. We want, to know, we want better visibility into whether or not the firmware update process that we were doing worked. Right now, on some devices, it's completely blind. On other devices, we can see pretty closely whether or not we're getting where we expect it to go. Um, right now, firmware update tooling doesn't tell us what was in there before. Again, all you get out is just a device string. Uh, we're working, working with vendors to help them come up with better tools so that we can read out all the firmware, uh, regardless of what the current device is thinking about, regardless of what the current firmware running on there is intending for us to do. Um, and then the other thing is we hope to be able to chain these things back into the trusted boot chain so that you can remotely verify that your servers are running the firmware that you expect to have happen. Um, other things we can worry about, runtime integrity. That's a non-trivial problem. Um, we talk to vendors. Vendors are telling us about efforts they're making towards runtime integrity, but it's still a really, really hard problem. And I think before we can fundamentally solve it, we have to change the way that firmware is developed. Right now, the firmwares that are running in your devices make the device work mostly, and they have fewer bugs than would prevent you from buying the hardware, but they aren't secure. They're not highly, highly engineered systems in the same way that we think about high integrity software in other contexts. Uh, if you have good ideas about this, we'd like to hear them. Uh, we do talk to the vendors, and sometimes they even do what we ask. Um, so what, what have we talked about here? Gaining the assurance of the, firm, of the firmware in your hardware is hard, but it's possible. Uh, if we all ask for these things from our vendors collectively, we'll have a much better chance of getting them. And uh, I can't tell you which vendor, but one vendor recently gave me a, a spec that they had written based on what we had been asking for that will allow us to have this style, hardware-rooted integrity check on what firmware is in the device. And uh, you know, I, I suspect that that will eventually become public and part of their hardware line that they sell to everyone. Um, so we're moving towards a world where device firmware can be verified. Uh, with that, we've got question and answer time, and uh, thank you. So any... Uh, what kind of examples are you looking for? Like how to ask for this? Yeah, how to do it. Okay, yes. So he wants to know how do you pester vendors to get them to give you good, give you these results? Well, for starters, you start explaining the problem you have to them, and uh, the specific things we've been asking them for are: Can you give us hardware-rooted ways to get in to read out the firmware that we have in the device now? Can you give us hardware-rooted ways to revert the firmware to a known good state? Um, this works better when you're a large customer. Oh, yes. Also, the other easy way is including these kinds of specifications in the RFC when you're, when you're getting the quote. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, there's that vendor that gave me the spec to do the things that I asked for. Thank you. Oh. He asked, he said, sounds like we're in the same problem space. Well, yeah, the question is really like, if you guys try asking them to just open up their specs more generally, is there any industry effort that you guys see in your position? So the question was, have we asked them to open up their specs more generally, and is there an industry standard effort? Uh, Yes, we've asked them to open up their specs more generally. Usually they won't do that because they're embarrassing things in the firmware. Uh, is there an industry effort? Yes, there are. Uh, I can tell you who to talk to if you want to be involved in that afterwards. I, I, a lot of very large enterprise customers, uh, very large scale operators are all asking for the same set of things. Right, we're, we're not the only ones asking for similar mechanisms. 
Uh, Google and Microsoft are both very publicly talking about how to improve device measurement. Um, so the, the, a large portion of the industry is trying to do better in this area um, and forcing vendors kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Over there by the light. So the question is, do I have advice for using this to improve, improve supply chain security? My goal with this work is to make sure that the hardware that lands in the data center runs exactly the firmware that I have put there after it arrives in the data center, and that fiddling with, the, fiddling with this firmware in the supply chain doesn't help an attacker. Uh, I'm not entirely there yet, but it's getting there. Yep. Have you looked into writing your own BIOS? Have we looked into writing our own BIOS? Yes, I work for a hardware manufacturer. We do write our own BIOS. And we do make changes to improve this kind of security. But this, the, the problems we're facing here are the firmwares that we don't have that kind of control over in the, in the devices outside the server. Behind there? So Oracle is a little different because you guys make your own stuff. It's yeah. easy for you to, uh, I think, provide reasonable end of life for things. But do you think hardware vendors in general have a moral or ethical obligation So the question is, do hardware vendors have an a moral obligation to make these things possible so that end users can use their hardware after they're gone? Uh, I would very much like to live in a world where that is universally the case. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, have we used the Intel ME to help us with this? Uh, the, the answer is that would require Intel to support this kind of stuff within the ME. So I will let you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Um, when we're doing this kind of stuff, we are intentionally putting the systems into a real deterministic state. So we generally have not run into those kinds of problems. The, the question was, with, with new architectures, NUMA and that kind of thing, does this, uh, does this create new problems? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Have you tried a Google Python module? Have you, or have you tried a side channel to detect the execution path of the bio? So the question is, have we tried the Google Titan module or used side channels to detect the execution of the BIOS? Um, in our system, because I have direct write access to the BIOS, when the system is completely powered off, I can write the BIOS into a known state regardless of what was there before. So uh, the, the hardware model doesn't require Titan in quite the same way that Google does. Um, once I've done that, then I can use the TPM to attest that the system has booted after that. It, it's also worth pointing out that Google is building a lot of their own custom hardware to insert Titan into it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and Cerberus is very similar along those lines. So if you don't actually build that support in from the beginning, uh, it's real hard to use. Any others? So the, the question was, is when you're small, it's hard to get this kind of help from vendors. Uh, to some degree, we're trying to encourage vendors to release this information publicly so that the work that we're doing can be helpful to everyone else as well. Uh, the other thing you'll find is that asking smaller vendors directly uh, generally is easier. Smaller vendors are generally easier to talk to than big vendors. Um, 
I don't know of a good way to solve this problem generally for the community at whole, as a whole yet, other than asking for those kind of in-band features documented by the vendor as a normal way of doing business. And so that's what I've been asking. Other questions? Uh, yeah? He's asking, do we see this vendor support improving, plateauing, getting better? I think that it's going to get better because as an industry, I know that we're all asking for, many of the big players are asking for very similar features. And, uh, you know, as, as the similar features go from things that a vendor adds to the firmware as they customize it for a customer, to things that are already in the hardware anyway because a big customer asked for it a couple of years ago, uh, that this is, this is going to be improving across the board. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. As major vendors, do you guys try to coordinate with each other to this The question is, as major vendors, do we coordinate? Yes, absolutely. We, uh, there are a number of private industry consortiums that are working together to make this, to ask vendors in a coherent way for things. Um, I think in many cases, up until now, we have been asking similar but incompatible things, thank you, that, uh, that have forced vendors into a lot of different way, different angles, and we're working together to try to ask for the same thing so we can get it. All right. Thank you. Oh, oh, one more? Yeah. Um, a couple of hard questions, and I apologize if it's getting answered to some time. But uh, having worked with the vendor community off and on for 15 years out of a testing laboratory, I've run into similar kinds of situations. And two of the answers that we used to get a lot that were very frustrating were, or three, I should say, A, none of our customers are asking for it. We've already addressed that. Uh, B, that would require additional hardware, which costs X. So the, the question was, uh, what are the marginal costs to support this above and beyond what you're already paying? And how do you address uh, vendor concerns about intellectual property? So the, the marginal cost uh, for a lot of this is actually pretty low. Um, vendors are really moving to support secure boot in most of the devices. That's probably the biggest part of the cost. Um, recovery mechanisms are something they're building for their own uses anyways. Uh, in order to build and test and mass produce devices, they have to have a lot of these capabilities, so there's not a lot of marginal cost to build it in. Um, as far as the IP, yeah, uh, more than once they've come back and said, no, we're not going to support you doing that. Or, or they've said, you can't know that thing that you've found out. <laughs> Yep, yeah, we, we have that. We have the issue of, of sometimes the, the jumper isn't there, too. Tenth of a cent difference in the production cost. And to those of us standing around or sitting here, a tenth of a cent doesn't mean anything but you multiply times hundreds of thousands or more units, and the bean counters notice that. So that's the reason I asked that. And, and what is not much additional cost? Uh, yeah, so in, in our case, um, we're willing to pay more to get that jumper installed. And so we, we've solved the marginal cost of, yeah, they're trying to save component prices by not populating things on the board, by telling them, hey, we'll pay you the extra 10 cents per board well, actually, to populate be, that. We'll pay you a couple bucks more per board because now we have to have a special run. Yeah. Um, or the other, the other option is you pay someone else to put that on after the vendors built their product. So this, this is why we, we really want to see for more devices in band mechanisms, whether it's measurement or recovery, because then there's no additional thing you have to put on beyond the standard interfaces in order to use it. Well, thank you all. Thanks.